Today our message is about Jesus protects Jacob as he leaves Laban. The Holy Spirit comes to Jacob and he says it's time to leave Laban. And we're going to look at those scriptures today. We're only going to read 38, uh, Genesis 31, 38 through 55. We're just going to focus on that short, uh, pa- those short, those short, uh, that short passage. Anyway, let's try to read this together. This is Jacob speaking after Laban cannot find the idols because Rachel is sitting on them. <laughs> which is a metaphor about idols. Anyway, these 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was, by day the heat consumed me, and the cold by night and my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years I have been in your house, I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters. The children are my children. The flocks are my flocks. All that you see is mine. But what can I do this day for these my daughters or for their children whom they have born? Come now, let us make a covenant you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha, but Jacob called it Galid, which is a shortened form of Gilead. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, he named it Galid. And Mizpah, for he said, the Lord watch between me and you. All right. When you are out of one another's sight, if you oppress my daughters, or if you take, my, take wives beside my daughters, although no one is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, see this heap and the pillar which I have set between you and me? This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness, that I will not pass over this heap to you, and you will not pass over this heap and pillar to, do, to me to do harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor and the God of their father judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac, and Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and called his kinsmen to eat bread. They ate bread and spent the night in the hill country. Early in the morning, Laban arose and he kissed his dreamy children and his daughters and blessed them. And then Laban returned home. I should have you guys read this every week. Here's our, let's pray over the word. Lord God, we want to thank you for your word. You, you, you've, you, once again, you've said that everything in your word, every jot and iota is not going to pass away. That means it's meaningful for us. Lord, you said that your word is given for our edification to build us up, to teach us what you are like, and also to teach us what we are like. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, enlighten us through your word today. Show us more about who you are and what you are about on this planet and how you work uh, in, in people's lives, Father. For the patriarchs truly are our examples, as Donna said. Lord, we thank you for this time in your word, and we pray that your Holy Spirit's power and grace would work through me to our congregation, work in my heart too, Lord, because we all need a fresh touch from Jesus. Amen. Here's our message map. We're going to see that Laban is lost in lust for stuff. And he won't let go of what Jacob has actually earned. Jacob said, I worked 20 years, 14 for your daughters, six to build my own flock. And Laban repeats that, follows that up with, it's all mine. Everything's mine. We're going to see that God warns Laban and will watch between him and Jacob. Last week we read in chapter, uh, the beginning of chapter 31, that God came to Jacob, I'm sorry, to Laban in a dream and said, do not say anything positive or negative to Jacob. Don't say anything good or bad to him. We're going to see that Jacob, the selfish grasper, has undergone an amazing 20-year transformation. 
and he has become the selfless go-getter. We're going to see that like Jacob, God disciplines and transitions all the disciples he calls. So as believers, God sometimes calls us to extricate ourselves from situations that we, we seem trapped in. And Jacob has been trapped. He doesn't think he really can go home. <laughs> he still has that bridge. He's got to take a huge step of faith to go home because the last time he saw his brother, his brother was threatening to kill him over conniving the birthright from, uh, from Isaac, the blessing from Isaac, their dad. So let's unpack this. Your first set of fill-ins. Laban won't let go of what is Jacob, and he tries to hold on to what Jacob has earned. Now, then Laban answered and said to Jacob, the daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. Is that the deal that, that they made? No, they made a fair deal, and Laban has kept changing the, uh, the, 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 the terms of the contract because he wants to keep it all. Have you ever been woefully trapped in selfishness? I remember as a kid once conniving my brother out of something. And I thought, this is wrong. I got one already. Because our parents bought him one, bought me one. But I wanted his. And I was trying to connive him out of it. And I knew it was wrong. But I couldn't stop myself. You ever be, you're woefully trapped in your lust for stuff. Anyway, the daughters who now are Jacob, uh, Laban claims that everything is mine. That's your first fill-in. He's lost in the lust for stuff. For stuff. There's a little bit of Laban in all of us, I think. You know, what's yours is mine, and what's mine is mine. <laughs> the daughters, Laban claims the daughters that are really Jacob's, because he earned them. He worked for those women. The children that Jacob claims are really Jacob's children. Laban didn't have those babies. The flocks that Laban claims, he says, everything you see is mine. No. Jacob specifically made a deal that whatever was spotted and modeled, that way you could tell yours from mine. He's claiming Jacob's flocks. And all that Jacob has worked for contra by contractual agreement, Laban is trying to renege on. What do you think God would do with a guy like Laban? Laban suffers from this me-centered, selfish outlook which probably is part of his natural disposition, but it's probably also been fueled by his idolatry and witchcraft. You know the problem with, with uh, false religions is they don't generate the human character. They don't regenerate the human nature. You, we, we're we're going to see next week, as we saw this week in the, um, in the church history course, what happens when people get religious and government power and they are not regenerated. They don't have the love of Christ motivating their heart and their activities in relation to other people. I don't know if it's going to be brought up in this week in the course, but there is one day that, that one pope kills more Christians than Christians who died under, under the Muslim sword up to that point in time. And one day, a pope is going to kill that many Christians. We're going to see next week, however, that because of the uh, people wanting to get out from under the false religion and because the false religious heads had government power and control, one out of every five men in Europe will die. 20% of the population will die fighting for its freedom because they don't have government power and armies behind them. But still, like I said, if you want to stop Christianity, you better bring an army. Because you're not going to stop it. And they are going to try. 20% of the male population is, about, is going to die in Europe. Fighting for, their, fighting for the right to worship God the way the Bible says. And that needs to be a, sort of an example for we Christians in America. All right. Galatians 5.20 says, Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, and factions are all lumped together under people who worship false religions. 
Proverbs 18.1 says this, an unfriendly person pursues selfish ends and against all sound judgment. Now, God has already come to, to Laban and, and kind of put the fear, put the, that's why he's called the fear of Isaac. We're going to unpack that in a moment. He put the fear of God in him. And it says, against all sound judgment starts quarrels. Do you think if you, were, if you had that dream that Jacob had, that you would think, hmm, there's a God that Jacob, I'm sorry, if you had the dream that Laban had, there's a dream, there's a God that Jacob serves who is greater than my gods. I might want to repent and convert. But no, Laban is like Lady Macbeth. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth will try to the last. I'm not going to get into that, but there's a lot of it's a cool story there about uh, a prophecy in the, in the play says that Macbeth will not get disposed. He kills the king to become the king, so everybody hates him. But he's got a lot of power, so they're kind of scared of him. And the prophecy is that Macbeth will never be deposed until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane Castle. Until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane. And uh, MacDonald, the hero of the story, he has his army passing through Burnham Wood. And he goes, hey, we got to kind of camouflage ourselves. So every man hack down a bow and we'll walk up to the castle with these bows in front of us. And Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane Castle. I'm, I'm sort of an evil guy in my heart. So if I had gotten that prophecy, the last place I would go is, is Dunsinane Castle. <laughs> but it's prophecy. Once God has set his, his terms against you, you have no choice but to go to, to, to Dunsinane Castle. Anyway, because the Bible says, God says, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He goes, I melt it, I melt it, and I, I mold it, I shape it. All right, now, the Bible also says these things about being selfish in the New Testament. James 3.16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find discord in every evil practice. James 3.14, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. In other words, confess it. Get over it, because if you act on it, it's going to act on you. Philippians 2.3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. You know what jealousy does? Paul was in prison. He says this in Philippians 1.17. There were some people that were preaching the gospel, knowing that it would get Paul in deeper trouble while he was in prison. The powers that shouldn't be, who uh, controlled the politically appointed religious crowd, would say, why are you preaching that stuff? Well, I got it from Paul. <laughs> Galatians, I did that. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Laban judges Jacob by Laban's value system. And I learned this um, when, I was, when I first became a manager. If I have evil in my heart, I'm going to try to start seeing that evil in my employees. So I used to pray, God, give me your heart for, 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 for these people. Because I need to think about them the way you think about them. Because left to my own devices, I will judge them by my own messed up value system. See, Laban said to Jacob, what have you done that you've tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? Did he drive away the daughters? No. Well, who probably has the swords drawn, by the way? Laban. Laban and his people. He's judging Jacob by his own value system. He goes, if you oppress my daughters, So driving, he, accuses, he accuses Jacob of driving away his daughters as captives, which is not true. The truth is Laban has held Jacob captive for 20 years, so he's judging Jacob by his own value system. He says, if you, he, said, he accuses Jacob of wanting to oppress his daughters, but we know that it's Jacob who's done all the, I'm sorry, it's Laban who's done all the oppressing of Jacob. Remember last week we saw that they made the deal for the modded sheep and the spotted sheep and, um, and the striped sheep and goats, and J Laban puts his sons in charge of Jacob's flock. Because every time that flock started to grow, they'd run back to dad and say, dad, 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 now this is happening with this flock. And, they, and he tried to, so he tried, Laban tried to trick him, tried to change the terms of the contract. And Jacob says, you change the contract this way, it's not my fault, God made the flock grow another way. He accuses Jacob of wanting additional wives. 
when it was Laban who tricked Jacob into polygamy in the first place. Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, and he gets Leah. He's accusing Jacob of wanting to harm him, when in fact, it's Laban throughout the past 20 years has harmed Jacob. We tend to judge people by our, messed up, our own messed up value system. What's the value system we should be using when we, t when, we, when we think about other people? God's value system. We should literally pray, Lord, give me your heart for these people. Give me your heart for each other. Give us your heart for each other. Because left to our own devices, we'll get into selfishness and backbiting. And Romans 2, 3 says this. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? You ever hear people and they say, well, I just don't believe in whatever because that's what I've always said. And I'm like, well, who are you to always say when the Bible was written a long time before you were born? You better get over what you always say. Get into what God says. All right. God is trying to... Pr Remember Corey Ten Boone said this. She goes, I try to hold on to the things of the world very lightly. Because if I hold on to them too tightly, it hurts so much when God has to pry them from my hands. <laughs> so Laban has to learn... We're going, let's go to our next slide. Laban has to learn to let go. We always say that, right? Let go and let God. That's, you know, how many of you are type A's? Oh, you've achieved things in your life. You ran businesses. You do all these things. You, you figure out how to do things like you're type A. So the last thing you can do is, is sit still. <laughs> you're used to your doers. And so it's very hard for doers to let go and let God. But the Lord can train us. God can train us to fight right. You ever have to discipline employees in, in, in a godly way? He can train us to fight right. I mean, marriages survive because people learn to fight right. Stay in the moment. It's not like, well, you always. Nobody, nobody really always. Oh, maybe 90% of the time, but no. <laughs> All right, Laban needs to learn to let go of what, what is Jacob's. But God came to Laban. This is in uh, uh, Genesis 31, 24, and verses 29. But God came to Laban, the Aramean, the, the Syrian. Notice how he's pointing out his, uh, his heritage, his pagan heritage. In a dream by night and said to him, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And in Genesis 29, 31, 29, this is what Laban says. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful not to speak either good or bad to Jacob. Now, Laban has very bad intentions. If God didn't show up, Laban would use his army to drag the wives and the children back and the flocks back. Because he says in, in, in Genesis 30, 27, remember, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you, Jacob. There's no, there's no holiness in this. There's no, there's no regeneration. There's no repentance. There's no, and there really is no forgiveness of sins either. That's why God comes to him in a dream. Now, God reveals himself to Laban in a dream. And this particular revelation of God is to prove himself as God to Laban, to convince him not to interfere with God's plan for Jacob's life. You know, the Bible literally says in Proverbs that when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he even makes his enemies lie down and be at peace with him. So we have to assume, however, that when God comes to you in a dream and warns you, that dream is not pleasant. It's, it's got to be, Laban must have woken up in a, in a cold sweat. All right, next one. Now, this is cool. Notice the name. They're, you know, they're adding a name to the name of God here, in a sense. They're revealing, more, so they're revealing something about God's character in this name, the fear of Isaac. Abraham was called the friend of God. And, and Isaac worked and labored in the fear of God. Remember, he was 31, 31, 32, 33 years old when, his, when, he, when he allowed himself in the plan of God to be strapped to the, down as a sacrifice. 
You can imagine the discussion. Abraham saying, well, I, 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 Holy Spirit tells us in Hebrews, Abraham believed that, well, you're the child of promise. If God wants me to do this, he's going to resurrect you. Okay, Dad, I trust God to do that. You know, Isaac is the first child in history to be circumcised as a baby. When, 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 when the servant brings, when Abraham's servant brings Isaac, his wife, he is meditating and praying. This guy had a, had a different sort of sensitivity towards the Lord than most people. Now, this term, the fear of Isaac, appears twice in Scripture. It's only in this passage, too. It's only like what, uh, 51 in, in, uh, 42 and uh, 51 through 53. And it's interesting, too, because Jacob uses it first in, 40, in verse 42, but then uh, Laban uses it in verses uh, 51 through 53. It's Laban speaking uh, through, through verses 52 and 53. Now, the fear of Isaac means literally that God is the fearful one who must be obeyed. Benson says this. He says, God is the fear of Isaac who sanctified the Lord in his heart. Barnes says it this way. The term refers to the God who Isaac fears. God is the object of Isaac's fear and sacred awe. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. Wisdom. I was talking to a Christian. She was talking to a person who, who apparently might have been or might not have been a Christian. And they were talking about public schools. And they were wondering, how can the public schools have turned like they did? How can they be doing this to children? And I said, well, think about it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If, you're, if you start with your premise, as public school has now, no, God, we're not believing in that. We're not, having any, we're not going to acknowledge that in any particular way. The schools now have anything but wisdom. It's Romans 1, professing themselves to be wise, they have become as fools. If we don't convert those people, your children are now trapped in foolishness. So God intervenes in this, in the, in this situation, and, that, and his intervention is under the name of the fear of Isaac. Antagonism and deception have been the character and the quality of the relationship between Jacob and Laban. And it's Laban who says, well, let's make a covenant. Because he's like, I think the fear is probably going to travel with Isaac. And I'm going to set up a pillar so it doesn't come back my way. <laughs> and he says, what can I do? Because he's not changing his behavior or character. He can't win this one. He's going to have to let it go. But what he wants to make sure is that I'm going to go back and do my thing. <laughs> and I don't, want, I don't want Jacob coming back and interfering with it. I don't want the, he really doesn't want the God of Jacob. So they each swear this vow. Let's go on to the next slide. And maybe Isaac is kind of digging it in because Laban tells uh, Jacob about the dream and maybe Jacob sort of, you know, puts the knife in and twists it and says, yeah, the fear of Isaac. <laughs> the fear of my father, Isaac. Mm. All right. Now, the fear of Isaac communicates what? One, God is awesome to support and secure his role and participation in the Abrahamic covenant. Did God choose perfect people? You know, when I was a young Christian, I was reading the Bible and, and God tells Abraham, no, no, no. Through Sarah, your wife Sarah will have a baby this time next year. And the next thing Abraham does is he gives Sarah away. He lies and says, she's my sister. He gives Sarah away. I was reading that as a young Christian. I'm like, how can he do that? He's supposed to be the patriarch. I was expecting all the patriarchs to be perfect people. Yeah. I was stunned. I'm like, God kind of took a jamoke like me 
a weasel like me, and he made him a patriarch. Because God is awesome to support and secure his role and participation in the Abrahamic covenant. Was it Paul got knocked off his horse and he's blind and God says to him, come, I'm going to show you what great and mighty things you will suffer for my name. Great and mighty, my name. Great. There probably has been no evangelist like the evangelist Paul. I, I, God comes and says, come here, I want to show you some, what great and mighty, you want to serve God? Hmm? Show up church every day, every week early, set up all this stuff. <laughs> Sir, it's, it's glorious, isn't it? <laughs> All right, number two, it means that God is a holy terror who can cause panic in his enemies. I gave you a bunch of Bible verses. You ought to go read those Bible verses. You got a bunch of Bible verses under there? Yeah. Let's unpack some of those. I'll get, tell you what some of those mean. Let's see. I'll go, I'll go through the whole list first. And we'll, oh, we'll do panic. We'll do panic. It's here. Which ones do I have? Joshua 5, 1. As soon as the kings, as soon as all the kings of the Amorites were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites uh, who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they crossed over, their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. You know, the thing, same thing happened during the Civil War. I'm sorry, during the American Revolutionary War. So many times when George Washington, his ragtag army needed to move cannons, there was thunder and lightning. So you couldn't hear the horses clicking along and, and pulling those heavy cannons. Sometimes George Washington and his men would get on a boat and cross the water and the, 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 and, the, and the British would try to follow them and there would be a gale and, and a storm and they couldn't follow them. And you, go read, you can go read the historical writings of the British officers saying it seems like God himself is fighting for George Washington. That's why the Founding Fathers were so focused on God has done this. Well, at the Constitutional Convention, um, you, know, you know, Donnie Swaggart, Jimmy Swaggart's son, they got this TV show. It was on Channel 90 last, week, last night. I sent out people out an email after I watched it about 10 minutes about these very things I'm telling you about with, with uh, George Washington and company. It was really cool. And I guess it's going to be on next Saturday night, too. I don't know if it comes on 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. It was somewhere around there. I'm going to look it up. But I also found some of the videos on YouTube. Anyway, uh, 1 Samuel 7, 10, and 14. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. Notice, you worship as the enemy attacks. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. In 1 Samuel verses 14, I'm sorry, chapter 14, verses 15 through 20, God uses Jonathan, Saul's son, to create a panic within the Philistine army. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle, and behold, every Philistine sword was against his own fellow. The panic started killing each other, and there was very great confusion. 2 Chronicles 14. Um, 14 verse 14. Remember, 2 Chronicles um, 7 is the famous passage about if my people who are called by my name. All right, well, second, here's 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Judah's king Asa, Asa, I'm doing a study on revival. And there are five revivals in Old, in Old Testament Israel. And Asa leads, I think, the first or the second one. I'm studying them all to see what, what, what really is national revival. What takes place? Who does what? I will tell you this. The religious guys go to the king and say, King, you got to repent. That starts the, the national revival. Separation of church and state, you keep, pray, you, keep, you keep proclaiming that. Why you go to national day of prayer events? No revival in your country. It has to be. Jonah went and proclaimed it, uh, uh, told Nineveh that you got to repent. If the message did not reach the palace and the palace believe it, then there could be no national fast called. The, mess, the word of God has to reach the highest levels of government and it has to trickle down through the people. All five revivals have that in common. Three-dimensional leadership. You've got to find the patterns. You've got to find what's repeated. Sometimes you can't replicate the pattern. We're going to see that in some of the revivals throughout church history. They're all different as we go through our church history course. But anyway, 2 Chronicles 14. Judah, King Asa, defeats a million-man Ethiopian army. Second Chronicles 14, 14 says this. 
And they attacked all the cities around Gerar, for the fear of the Lord was upon them. They plundered all the cities, for there was much plunder in them. The fear of the Lord comes upon the Ethiopian army, and it panics, even though it has vastly greater numbers than the Israeli army. Anyway, number three, the fear of Isaac communicates that God's friends and the people who are called by his name need to have great respect for him. They were saying on uh, the, this TV show last night, uh, just, uh, Francis and Friends or Jimmy Swagger, whatever it was, Johnny Swagger, J Donnie Swagger, whatever. I forget what they call Oh, the show was called Preachers, Preachers, Patriots, and Providence. And I panicked. I said, oh gosh, the fourth part of my book is called uh, Prophets, Patriots, and, Pro and Providence. But there's room for all these kinds of theories because they're very close to where I am. Anyway. If we do not, uh, and one of the things they brought out in the show is how did America fall? They said, well, the churches quit teaching the word of God. They were reading letters on the next show of all the, I don't know, I want to say foolish ideas that people have about scriptures. So the churches don't go line by line through scripture. They don't teach these things. In, you know how many churches would not even tell you that there was a term for the fear of Isaac in the Bible? Because that's not loving. And we have to ask the question, do we love love or do we love God? Or do we love God's love? But we don't love God. And what good has it done us? I've preached in some of the biggest churches and been an elder in some of the biggest churches in this community. And I used to say, God, how can this church be full and, and, and this other person got elected to office? How can this happen? What has gone wrong? Anyway, I think as God's people, you know what I do when I approach, approach the scripture now? I don't approach it as a Baptist. I don't approach it as a charismatic. I don't approach it as a Pentecostal. I've even stopped approaching the scripture as a Bapticostal. <laughs> a Bapticostal, that's why I named it. You know, for 20 years or so, I told everybody I'm a Bapticostal. I, I don't even do that anymore. I'm like, God, this is your word. It's here for a reason. It's not making much sense to me in this moment. But Lord, you have to bless me to show me what resources I should study to get to the meaning of your word. Because I'm going to miss something if I try to read it as a Bapticostal or as a black man. Or the only way to read the Bible is as a sinner man. I'm a sinner and I am saved by your grace. So show me where your grace is in this passage. And, and I know you're going to do it anyway, but hey, if, while you're at it, if you want to show me where my sin is too, I, I need to grow. So I'm like, I need to grow, so show it to me. <laughs>
And they say, okay, God, now we're going to go. And God says, don't go. But they go in their zeal. And they get defeated again. So God is not our errand boy. You have to stay on his plan the whole part of the way. And that's a challenge for us in America, how our churches have gone astray. Anyway, when Joshua, was, I did that. Now, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 says this. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. We try to persuade others. Because we know what it is to fear the Lord. All right, number four, the fear, the term, the fear of Isaac means that God should be an object of dread. If you can in your margin up above, can you write the word object of? I think I only gave you dread. When I was fixing or working on that, I must have deleted the term, the words object of. And I don't think there's enough space for you to write all three words in there. So the word we're really looking for is dread. God should be an object of dread to those whom he will judge. How many of you, somebody told you about the love of God? I remember I had a man all the time tell me about the love of God. I'm with him, on, I was, when we first came in this morning, I got the computer work and I sent him a thing on Facebook because he had said something to me. The guy led me to Christ in the military. And he says to me over the phone a couple weeks ago, he goes, Earl, I used to preach, I only preach the love of Christ Jesus to you. You've got all this stuff about the Old Testament and judgment and all these things, and the commands. And he goes, people get led to the Lord by the love of God. And I said, Tom, you used to tell me about the love of God during the day. And I would go home with my bad self and sit in bed and sweat hell at night. I said, now the love of God told me what to do about going to hell. I learned from the love of God, God doesn't want me to go to hell. But I came to Christ because I was afraid of going to hell. You preach love and the Lord terrorized me at night. And I said, thank God for the love because it taught me what to do about, the, about, about that fear. Turn it over to Jesus. All right, I'm going to move through this, try to kind of move through this quickly. All right, let's move on. Now, here's that fear of Isaac thing. Notice that, 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 that they're, they're, they're giving up. When they say the fear of Isaac, which is the first time we've ever heard this in the Scripture, they're revealing more about God's character as time goes on. So, verse 42, If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. In other words, you would have brought your army here, Laban, and taken everything and gone, and gone back home. You, he, would, he would even have taken his daughters. So in this verse, what do we learn about God? We learn the God of Abraham oversees his covenant. And he will look out for, for Abraham's descendants. We, we see through this term, the fear of God, the God, the God of Abraham op oversees his covenant with Abraham and his descendants. That's what, that's, that's what that, this, this verse is telling us. We see that the fear of Isaac, which appears only two times in Scripture, means that God is the object of Isaac's awe, Isaac's sacred awe. Uh, Isaac served God with a sense of, oh, wow, that's God. How many of you ever want to have a meeting with him like, like the patriarchs did? Anybody? <laughs> it probably eventually would be a good thing. <laughs> That's not always bad. It would be cool to have the Holy Spirit come upon you and you get this unction and he, he explains what he wants you to do with your life or at least the next steps. It's pretty cool. All right. Now, um, it means in this passage of scripture, we learn that God is on Jacob's side to support him against the wiles of Laban as well as to secure his role and participation in the Abrahamic covenant. I'm going to show you that in the next slide. It communicates that God sees. God is he who sees. He's mindful of our affliction. He understands the, the labor of our hands. He understands what we have to go through. People walked up to me after a church service when I was a freshman in college. They said, you're going to do this thing with the Veterans Administration someday. And I did know that God had a plan for our lives. I, I, I wanted to work with kids. And I felt called to do that. And God sent me off as an English teacher to work with kids. I knew that that was my call. All right. He sees and he, and he wants us to do. He, he sees and he works to us at our work. All right. He rebukes or he renders judgment or a verdict. And he warns people. See, a, a rebuke is good because it, it's not too late. If you die without responding to the rebuke, then it's too late. So a rebuke is actually an act of God's love. Christian told me, he said that, you know, you, you, these guys are coming around, but you're so harsh on them. And I said, well, what happened? Well, John said this when you left, so I said that. And, John, and the, Paul said this. He's, they're getting close. 
And then and she said, you got to stop being so harsh with them. And I said, well, my job is the, I'm an evangelist. My job is to say things that keep them up at night. My job is to unsettle the, is to unsettle the people who think they had got it all together. You know, as a salesman, you can't really sell me something until you first make me feel uncomfortable not having what you got. And, and so I said, what did you say? And when she got done, I said, you see, this is, this is the body of Christ working. I tell them about God's judgment. You tell them about God's love. She said, okay, I get it. She said, so you're not going to stop being harsh with them. I said, probably not. I said, obviously, something, they're moving, it's working. I said, we, we have a lot of jokes and laughs. All right. Um, you know what rebuke means? It means that God is properly assigning value as is fitting to the situation. You ever been rebuked? We learned a long time ago, right? A rebuke is like the light going on. You're walking in darkness, think you got it all together. The light comes on, it blinds you at first, and then you adjust to it, and you know you're far better off. But you didn't know that when you were, before you were rebuked, before that light came on. All right, now, here's Jacob's transformation. God has transformed, transformed Jacob over a 20-year period. Because Jacob says in verse 38, These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried. I have not eaten your rams, though you could out in the field. That's part of your pay. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss myself. From your hand you required it. If it was stolen by day or stolen by night, I was awake at night in the, in the day in the heat, and I, and I couldn't sleep but for my eyes at night in the cold. These 20 years I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters. I worked for them fair and square. I worked six years for my flocks. What has happened to Jacob? God over a 20, now notice how long it is, 20 years. Over a 20 year period, God has transformed Jacob from a selfish grasper to a selfless go-getter. Right? The last time Esau saw Jacob, he was tricking, can you, can you imagine that? You're putting on your brother's clothes and you're, and you're, and you're trying to lie to get what, what's your brother's. And God moves you for 20 years, over a 20 year period. You know what it was? He loved, he loved Rachel. That was his first selfless act that I love Rachel. So I'm going to go through some things for her. And God used that to get him to, to put up with these 20 years. Well, all of us guys have gone through that. We marry a woman and we think that, well, I'm just going to be who I am in this marriage. And no, God's going to transform you, <laughs> transform you. <laughs> I'm sure it happens to the ladies, too. So look at what he did. He goes, I did not eat the rams of your flocks. I bore the loss. I submitted. I, I, was, I selflessly did all these things. I went through, I, I put up with all these changes. You ever have a crappy job? Well, remember, remember how sometimes you get a job, you think this is a great career, and like two years later, it's just a job. <laughs> but God keeps you there longer than you want, and he's transforming your character. I had a job I did not like. I used to, I was a musician, so I was always making music binders and whatnot, and we had these recycled binders. They really were supposed to go back to the office, but I would take some home all the time, well, whenever I needed them. Now, probably they're going to be thrown away, but you don't know. They were really in a, in a, in to be used by people in the office. So I knew that that was wrong, but I did it. A few years later, I got a job that I loved, but I had very, very corrupt bosses. And they didn't care if we were able to do our jobs or not, truthfully. They, they went to jail. One of them got arrested for sure. The other guy had to resign. But anyway, I was talking to one of my friends in New York City, and she goes, you know, Earl, I have my own computer monitor in the office. I'm like, really? Because I couldn't get a new one. I had corrupt bosses. And I said, oh, well, we're upgrading our computers at home, so I brought my computer monitor to, to work. That, tr that changed over to I brought my old printer to work. That carried over to my secretary, brought her old printer to work, and I was literally buying out of my pocket the toner for both of those printers. God was transforming my character. Some of my clients well, found out what I was doing and they said, hey, you know, uh, I just got this, you know, huge check from whatever. Uh, can I can I do something for the office? And I'm like, well, you can only give us up to $75 gifts, but we don't need them for ourselves. Can you buy some toner for the printers? And they said, well, can I buy pizza and toner for the printers? Sure, you could do that. 
and God was transforming my character, I, I went from a selfish grasper to a selfless go-getter because I loved what I was doing and I knew that God was in it and he, and he transformed my character in that, in that next job. And I knew exactly what was happening. I looked back and I said, gee, I used to steal from my office. And now my office is stealing from me and I'm bringing all this stuff to the office. That's kind of what we saw last week, right? You'll reap what you sow. But it wasn't evil. It was good for me. I loved doing it. I would do it again. Anyway, you get all those fill-ins? I think the next one's yellow. Next slide's yellow so there's no fill-ins. Now, what was happening over these 20 years? Jacob was willing to accept reaping what he sowed. You can't grow unless you are willing to accept the discipline. He was willing to work for a total of 14 years for Rachel. He really only wanted to work seven, but it turned out 14. God will use your love for something to, tra to transform your character. He agreed to work another six years to support his flock, and he tolerated the wages being changed ten times. It's all part of God's plan for growth. All right, last slide. Now, here we are. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. I got some stories about that. Being a, quite a young jerk and getting saved. And the people that you have been a jerk with, you can't be a jerk with anymore. But they're jerks. And so you got to go and face up to those jerks. Matthew Henry asked this question regarding Genesis 36 through 42. If Jacob were willing, was willing, willingly consumed with heat in the day and frost by night to become the son-in-law of Laban, what should we refuse to endure to become the sons of God? Psalm 119, 36 says this, Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. You want a testimony? Put up with what God is putting you through. When we are in trials, whether it's your car sliding off the road, or your children smashing up one of your cars, whatever it happens to be, you got to say, God, what are you trying to transform in my character in relation to this situation? If you let God transform your character in that situation, you will develop a testimony. But if you kick against the pricks, you won't. Let's pray. God, we ask you to make us mindful of who you are and where you are in our trials. Father, I believe there are times that you're there, but you remove the awareness of your presence from us to see what we're going to do if we're not getting the spiritual lollipop of the, of, of the anointing of your presence at that time. You want us to walk by faith, not by our feelings. Now, Father, we do need feelings. We do need you to work through the power of your Holy Spirit to bless us emotionally so that we can sense who you are and what you're doing in our lives. But God, I pray that you would help us to be the type of people who respond as faithful followers who can trust you to work in all the situations we face. Father, we all can think of people that, that, that um, family members, friends, loved ones, associates, that we want to know you. We want to see these people submit to you, call out to you, call out for salvation, Lord God. And we pray, Father, that you would work in us and use us in the lives of these people. And more importantly, God, because we're not with them all the time, that you would raise up Bible-believing Christians to tell them and point them the way to Jesus Christ. Father, even if they're not Bible-believing, if they know your truth, Pray that you would, uh, like you spoke through to Balaam, uh, through a donkey, Lord, that you would speak to these people's hearts through the people and the situations that they uh, encounter day in and day out. Lord, Holy Spirit, you've been called the great hound of heaven. And we pray for these people that are in our hearts and minds right now, that you would get on their trail, sniff them out, Lord. You know, what, well, you know how they, what they're thinking and what they're feeling. You know what makes them tick. We pray, God, that you would reach them, help them work in their hearts, Holy Spirit, to bring them to repentance and to make an appropriate response to who Jesus is. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said. It's very